You know, I think most of us are educated enough in God's word to realize that God is more than capable of solving world hunger. Can I get an amen in the house of God? We read in the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the, the, uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt into the promised land, you remember the story where it says that God rained down bread from heaven known as manna. And so we see that even in that, there was a manifestation of a miracle that God fed people. And not only that, we see that when Jesus was in his ministry, there's the feeding of the 5,000. So we see that God is more than capable of providing the food uh, that would nourish everybody in our world. And so the natural question is, okay, well, if God really is love, if he cares about everybody, then why doesn't he feed everybody? And so that's what we're going to discuss today. But just so we can get our mind on food, is that okay? I want to do a quick survey to see what kind of people I'm working with here to see what your favorite food is. So participation, raising of hands, shout, whatever you need to do. How many of you would say that your favorite food is Mexican food? Any Mexican food lovers in the house, right? Tacos, burritos, taquitos, fajitas, uh, definitely not a bad meal. How about Italian food? Any Italianos in the house, right? Uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure if Little Caesar's Pizza qualifies, does it? I, I think that's out. Uh, how about Chinese food? Any Chinese food people in the house? Uh, my personal favorite, next one, Japanese food, especially sushi. Any sushi lovers in the house? Uh, and I, I guess since we're in America, I have to include, how about American food, right? Burgers, hot dogs, apple pie, all that good stuff. And so we understand hunger, right? We understand the, the sensation that we get in our physical bodies that drives us to go eat. And so, you know, the question we really need to ask is, okay, so we realize we all have this need. So why doesn't God fulfill that need? How big is that need? Give me just a moment to kind of set context and give you some statistics, if you will, about world hunger. This is from a website that's called World Hunger, and these are the statistics currently of our world today when it comes to hunger. It says that one in nine people worldwide do not get enough food. The number of hungry people in the world exceeds the population of the U.S., Canada, and the European Union combined. That's a lot of people. 34 million children suffer from severe acute malnutrition, a deadly condition if not treated. 34 million, that's just kids. Around a million children each year die from hunger-related causes, which means malnutrition causes 15% of child deaths. Some staggering numbers. And, you know, I mean, again, they're just facts and figures. And a lot of times we can just kind of, that just goes right over our head. But if nothing else, not that you're going to have a quiz on the numbers, that's pretty staggering, isn't it? That's a lot of people who are affected by hunger in our world. And so the question is, is if this God who we even read about in his Bible has done miracles, then why doesn't he do this thing again? Why doesn't he rain down bread from heaven? Or why can't Jesus come and, you know, say a quick prayer and, you know, multiply the the fish and the loaves and do all that stuff again? Does God not care any longer? Was it just for a moment? Was he just trying to do a fancy trick in those times? Why doesn't he seem to care now? Well, doing some more research on this topic, what's really staggering, and I'll just summarize some of the thoughts, is, is that, Even scientists agree that the problem with world hunger is not because there's not enough food. You see, they say that in between two and three times the amount of food that's produced would be easy to be able to distribute and to feed people two or three times over. So we're looking at this massive amount of food, and yet we can't solve world hunger. You know, it's real easy to kind of get on a soapbox and say, well, I mean, you know, if we had more Bill Gates in the world that were giving millions and billions and billions of dollars, we could solve this problem. But that's not really the problem. The problem is the distribution, that we have enough supply. And who is the ultimate supplier? Isn't that God? So God is doing his part. He's supplying the food uh, two to three times as much as we need. But yet we see these staggering numbers. You know, whether it's a religious leader, a, a guy who's in the, the government or someone who's a scientist, they all will tell you that the problem is the food waste 
that we see constantly in our world. You know, to get a little closer to home, the numbers in the United States are probably the most staggering around the world. You know, they tell you that in the United States of America, nearly 40% of the food that we produce is wasted before it's ever even consumed. Uh, you know, that's almost half. So half of the food. And, and again, we've probably all, maybe even as parents, tried to help our kids like, don't waste that. And so even in our own community, and we look around and it's a pretty affluent community, you realize that there's that much food that's being distributed? That's just from us. There's a lot of people that need food. And so the next question I had when I was challenged with this study is this. Okay, well, there's enough food, so God's doing his part there. Um, we just maybe need to get a little bit better organized and manage it more properly. But why is there hunger at all? Have you ever thought about that? Why did God create us with hunger? I mean, why can't we just wake up and not have this hunger pain, uh, have this need to go and to have three squares or whatever we have, and we just exist and we're self-sustaining and all of these kinds of things? Why is there hunger at all? And so it brings us to the question of what really hunger is designed to do, knowing that God has designed us with it. You know, when you look up the word hunger in Webster's Dictionary, it's defined this way. Hunger is our body's response to having eaten less than normal. It is caused by the brain reading changes of the levels of hormones and nutrients in our blood, therefore signaling our body to be able to replenish itself. You see, it's this reaction to the feeling that we have that causes what we know as hunger to nourish our bodies. However, it goes on to say, we often make poor choices and substitute proper nutrition for improper nutrition, therefore leading us to unhealthy lifestyles. And so we understand this dilemma, but I want to be able to camp for just a moment to help us to understand why God designed hunger. You see, hunger is a mechanism within us to motivate us to move. You see, without that, we would, if, think if you'd never had physical hunger, you would never be moved to try to grab food, produce food, whatever it would be, to be able to nourish your bodies. Now, when we talk about hunger, when it comes to God's word, it talks about hunger in the context of physical bodies, your emotional body or your soul, and also your spiritual well-being. Do we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we're called to? Do we have a hunger to be able to, to be loved and to love others, to have this emotional stability? You see, when it comes to all of these things, if we're not triggered to fill a void, then we will never do anything to try to fill that void. Am I making sense to anybody? So it's a motivation thing that God had to design us with so that we have a little bit of a get up and go. If not, we would just sit around like a bunch of sloths and be like, I'm good. I have good air. And for some of us, that sounds really good. You're like, I could sign up for that. Give me a beach chair and a beach and I'm good. But you see, it's the way that God motivates us to be productive in this life. You see, God has designed us to be creative, to be producers, to be those who are active in the life that we live. And so God has designed us with what we know as hunger. And without this, we have no incentive. We become complacent. We live a suppressed and a depressed life. And when I think about hunger, I think about all kinds of different things because I'm sure, uh, just by a show of hands, and maybe if it's not embarrassing to you, how many of you guys have ever been on a diet? I've been on so many, I couldn't even count them, right? So we can kind of relate to the whole diet thing and trying to eat healthy and having healthy choices and exercise and all of that stuff. But there are these things that sometimes, and they're not always natural, that we call food suppressants, right? Or appetite suppressants whether it comes in a pill form or whether it's natural. By the way, if you're taking notes and you are interested in these types of things, do you know that there's some natural foods or appetite suppressants that are such things like this? Ginger root, more water, coffee. Yeah, you guys are like, yeah, I could sign up for that one. Here's even the best one, dark chocolate. Can I get an amen in the house of God for that one? These are natural appetite suppressants. But when it comes to emotional and when it comes to spiritual hunger, 
Do you realize that there are also suppressants that suppress our appetite for the right things? Whether we're eating junk food or whether it's even things in our natural human condition like anger and bitterness, unforgiveness, that can suppress our appetite for the things of God as well. And we need to ask ourselves, where am I this morning when it comes to my spiritual appetite and my appetite for the things that God has put into my life to fulfill me? Because we have hunger to fill a void so that we can become full, right? We want to be able to be emotionally and spiritually and physically full. Like when you go to your favorite restaurant, anybody else have this experience? And you're just like, oh, I just need a break, right? Like that kind of full. Isn't that awesome? I love that feeling. It's like, okay. And isn't it so crazy the way our bodies work? It's like two hours later, you're like, hey, you guys hungry again? Hey, babe, you got something to snack on, right? But that's just the way God has designed us. And so what I want to be able to do is to take us through some scriptures to challenge us this morning about our appetite, where it's at, where it's directed, and what we're doing about it to be able to fill that void that we all have in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to start with me this morning in the book of Genesis, first book of the Bible. I'm going to be easy on you here as we start. Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25 is the story of two guys by the name of Jacob and Esau. Anybody ever hear these guys say, I've heard this one, right? These are these two twins, and they're very opposite, aren't they? One's kind of more, I guess, if you'd call it the mama's boy. He's cooking in the kitchen, doing the housework. The other one's kind of the daddy's guy. He's the man's man. He's, you know, hairy, it says, and he's a hunter, and he's kind of the ruffian guy, right? And we see this story, which I find very interesting, of something that happens in the life of these two brothers, where Esau now comes off of the hunting field, and he's confronted with Jacob. And I want to read this story to you as we launch into this study. Genesis chapter 25, verse 29, I'm going to start in. It reads this way. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stew for I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name is called Ed Edom, which means red, by the way. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die of what use is his birthright to me. And Jacob said, swear to me now. And so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way thus... Esau despised his birthright. And here's why I want to begin this way is because you see what's going on here. There's an appetite thing. There's a hunger thing that we all can identify with. He's had a hard day at work. He's coming in. Hey, feed me. I'm starving here. And now all of a sudden there's this negotiation that takes place and he makes, and this is my first point of the day, he makes a choice. You see, we all have choice. We all have these choices, these decisions to make. And he's making this decision. He's like, that's not that important to me right now. I'm in the in and now. I'm in the moment. I'm hungry. Give me this food. You see, God had something set up for Esau. This birthright was the birthright of the firstborn. And he would inherit not only all those things financially, but he would be the patriarch of the family. He would also get the spiritual blessing of his father passing on that responsibility. So it was a big deal. But in his mind, he's like, I could care less about the stupid birthright right now. I'm hungry, bro. I mean, what is it going to take? Okay, you got the birthright. But when I think about my life and all of our lives, don't we sometimes do the same thing? We know we may need to be patient to see this or God's calling us to something, but in the in and now and in the moment, it's like, I don't really care about that. I need to fulfill this need right now. And God's like, you're not fulfilling it the way I'm calling you to fulfill this need. We make a choice and we often make a bad choice. And it's because of number two point today. And that is we all have cravings. We all have choice and we all have cravings. And can I get an amen from anybody who struggles with any cravings that are outside of God's will? Anybody else deal with that? I got to give you two amens on that. I mean, could we be transparent in the house of God this morning and not, you know, try to put on our Christian hats and all act like we've got it all together? I, I, I don't struggle with anything, pastor. 
All the thoughts are pure. All of my actions are upstanding. <laughs> Liar! I mean, we have cravings, right? I mean, you're talking about the rock star of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, in Romans chapter 7, talks about this struggle that he had. This is a guy who's planting churches, preaching the gospel, watching God just work through his life amazingly, and he talks about this internal struggle. And he basically, to summarize it, puts it this way, hey, you know the things that I just, I want to avoid and want to stay away from? I find myself in the middle of them sometimes. And the things that, the things that I don't want to do, man, I, I need to stop doing those things. Why am I still doing those things? And the, and the things that I really want to do and be involved in, sometimes I, I don't find myself always doing those things. He talked about this internal struggle. In Galatians, he challenged the church with the same message when he said there's this war of our flesh and our spirit. They're at war with one another within us. You may have heard this one, but I think it's fitting. And so I'm going to repeat it if you've heard it before. It's called the parable of the two wolves. Let me read it to you. One evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside of people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside all of us. One is evil, it is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. And the other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. And the grandson thought about it for a minute, and then he asked, well, which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, and you can repeat it with me, the one you feed. Probably something you've heard, but isn't that so, that's so right on? I mean, I think all of us can identify with this. It's like, yeah, that, that describes me to a T. You know, I, I think about some of these scriptures that we want to camp out on and that we want to, you know, put on our bulletin boards or we want to be able to put on a t-shirt. I think, honestly, the scripture that most of us ought to be wearing as a t-shirt is the fact that my flesh is battling my spirit daily, amen? I mean, that's the real reality, and we've got to ask ourselves, how do we feed the right wolf? I mean, what's the formula here? What's the solution? We can acknowledge the fact that we have cravings that are outside of the will of God. And yeah, I get it. When we're in certain company, we want to act like we're all perfect Christians and we're doing great. But can we just quit fluffing everybody up and just say, you know what? I struggle too, bro. Amen. Man, it's tough out there. My, my attitude sometimes needs to be adjusted. The temptations I have sometimes I fall into. Man, it's difficult. But what I need to ask myself today is I'm willing to take a step in the right direction and say, God, I need more of a hunger for you. God, I want to be filled with the things that come from your spirit, not my flesh. I want to be able to acknowledge these cravings before you, God, and ask you to take them from me and help me to truly suppress those and to be able to have an appetite for the things of you, who you are. The question I have for you as we move forward, do you desire a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ this morning than you had when you walked in this place? He wants to meet you here. He wants to minister to you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to strengthen you. And yes, he might even want to convict you of something that's getting in the way of your personal relationship, the one that he died for you to be able to experience. But we've got to be honest. We like to suppress even the truth at times, don't we? We like to act like, oh, okay, well, if I just don't mention it and if I don't think about it too much, it's not really there. Yeah, it's really there. It's really there, and you keep feeding that wolf. That's the one that's going to bite you in the rear end. That's the one that's going to take over. That's the one that's going to lead you in the direction that you were hoping you would never end up in. That's life. You know, me and my wife had this conversation just the other day, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but I'm just going to be honest before you as well. We were talking about addiction. And we were talking about whether it's alcohol or whether it's drug addiction and the fact that they call it a disease from time to time. And that's something that I just don't agree with. I don't think it's a disease. 
You don't wake up one day and go, oh, I'm an alcoholic. It's a progression of bad choices that you make. And yes, addiction is something that should get our sympathy and should always get our support and help on how we can pull people out of that addiction. But it's not a disease. It's a series of bad choices because of a craving that came out from the enemy's mouth that you bought into. And you need to be able to acknowledge it and say, you know what, I've made some bad choices, God. Give me a hunger for the right things. I I don't any longer want to partake of these things. And so I'm going to be able to, first of all, give you just a little bit of a solution. And then I want to challenge you to maybe take a mental test with me as we come to a conclusion in this message. I want to make sure that I mention the thought of fasting and praying. Something that a lot of us have heard of. Something that we know is in the Bible. And we kind of get it. Okay, you don't eat food, right? You fast from something. But here's the reality. You don't fast so that you can lose weight, people. You fast so that you can now gain a better perspective of the things of heaven and of who God is. It's a way that we deny our physical bodies so that we can focus on the spiritual needs that we have. And so maybe that's a remedy that you need to be able to apply into your life this week to say, you know what, I I do feel disconnected from God. Maybe I I need to take that challenge, and whether it's for one meal, one day, whatever it needs to be in your case, to say, hey, I'm going to take this moment, and here's really the prescription. Is the moment that you would be eating, you take that time to be in prayer. You take that time to be before the Lord. You seek his face. It's not just, hey, I'm going to avoid food today and do my normal. Take that time that you would be in your, in your room eating, in your dining room eating, and say, hey, at this time, I'm going to crack open my Bible. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to pray, God, give me this, give me this, this sustaining power that I need to be able to move forward. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that, but I'm going to now move into what I think is critical for each one of us today, to be able to be honest, to take this mental test along with me, because here's the four things I want to point out that I think scripture calls us to be when it comes to our hunger, who we all are called to be. Number one, I want you to write down the word caretakers. We're all called to be caretakers. Now I come all the way back around to the very beginning of my message when I talk to you about the way that we manage or maybe mismanage is a better way to put it, the world's resources when it comes to food. Do you know that in the very beginning of creation, when God created Adam and Eve, he called them to be caretakers of this world. It tells us in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. You see, he was called because he said, you have authority, you have dominion. I want you to be a good steward of what I have put in your hands. And when it comes to our personal responsibility, what I want to challenge you to ask yourself is this, are you being a caretaker of what God has given to you? Your family, whatever that is, your occupation, maybe you own a business. Are you truly being a good steward of those resources that God has given you? That's something that we've got to ask ourselves because it puts us in line with what we're really hungry for, doesn't it? If I'm saying, hey, I, I have all this and it's, you know, get as much as I can and, and I, you know, you're being greedy about things and you're not taking care of people, your time is all about you, it's just selfish and self-pursuits, you've got to ask yourself, am I really hungering for what God wants me to hunger for? Am I taking these things serious? He's given me these things and he's put them into my hands and into my life. Am I being a good steward of his resource? Number two is the word contentment contentment. And it's hard to be content, isn't it? I mean, when you even think about our physical hunger, right? Remember I said that? It's like, I mean, you could eat that killer meal, your favorite meal, and like two, three hours later, you're like, man, is there any snacks around? I mean, it's continual, right? We're continuing to fill ourselves up. And so we can get in this place where we're never content. Some of us have a lot if we're really honest with ourselves, I mean, we have a lot of things that God has blessed us with, and yet we still don't find contentment for some reason. It's like, yeah, I mean, I got a pretty nice house, but it's not as nice as the the guy down the street. Yeah, my car's nice, but I mean, it is a year and a half old now, for God's sakes. I mean, you know, it's getting dated. I mean, and we can just get to this place where it's just, 
It's so gross if we're really honest with ourselves. We're just not content on the inside because we're hungering for something else to fill a void that will never be filled by those things. Do you guys know in the Bible it says this life is but a vapor? That it's here for a short period and yet we're trying to grab everything we can and think we're going to be fulfilled by the things around us. Hey, there's nothing wrong with taking care of business. Nothing wrong with taking care of your own. Nothing wrong with working hard for what you get. But the reality is, is it fulfilling in here? Are you content? There's a scripture found in 1 Timothy where the writer there is encouraging this young protege about godliness and contentment. And he uses this phrase, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And here's really the context of that scripture, is is that, hey, if you're, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm doing really good with my relationship with God, but yet you're not content on the inside, you don't really have great gain. There's still a void in your life. And so the question is, yes, as you hunger for the things of God, ask him to bring you that contentment in your heart. Are you content? Ryan hit on this, but I'm going to hit on it again, because when it comes to contentment, it is a huge scripture to understand. It's found in Philippians. Most of us are familiar with Philippians 4.13. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? I mean, especially us athletes, we love that one. Man, slap that on the back of my, you know, letterman's jacket. Man, I want to think, and hey, that's great. But the reality is the context isn't about an athletic competition. It's not like, hey, God, give me the ability to spin this football like nobody else ever has. God, give me the ability to hit a grand slam. What he's talking about there in context is he's talking about whether he's out of the highest of highs or the lowest of lows, whether he's doing really good financially or whether he's in the doldrums. He says, Christ gives me the strength in any one of those situations to find contentment. Because he says, whether I have plenty or whether I have lack, I have contentment in Jesus Christ. And so the question is, are we content in what God has given us and what God has done for us in our life spiritually? Are we finding true contentment? Number three, and I'm going to camp out on this one for a little while, and that is, are we contributing? We are called to be contributors. You see, the way that God has designed us, he says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we are made in his image, and we are his masterpieces. But he's created us to be active, to be those that are creative, and those that produce results. And so when we just sit around and we just consume everything around us, There's no fulfillment in that. It becomes empty. And I understand the consumer mentality. I mean, we have Target. We have Lowe's. We have Home Depot. We have Walmart. And think about this, people. If you're as old as me, you can go back in time and you can validate this truth. When I was a kid, you didn't get to go to one shop to buy everything you needed. You had to go to the grocery store to get your milk. Then you might have to go to the butcher to get your meat. Then you might have to go to another place to be able to get your vegetables. Then if you wanted to do anything like clothes shopping, there was another store. If you had to get anything for supplies for your pets, there was another store. Anybody tracking with me? I remember those days, Pastor. Aren't you glad that the customer service and the way that they've set up the situation, you can walk into one place called Target, Walmart, and just get whatever you need? They're like, okay, yeah, we need some, I need some you know, hair products. I, okay, I need some of this. I need it. And you can even get your, your pharmacy stuff there if you want to. You can get it all. Hey, you need glasses? They have them there too. We understand the customer mentality, this consumer mentality, and there's nothing wrong with it in the right application. I mean, that's the right application. But when we treat the whole world and our life that way, it's danger, Will Robinson. That's a problem, and that's where a lot of people are. A lot of people just think that, hey, you know, I'm just going to live life this way. People owe me everything, Uh, and people are getting more and more entitled. Can I get an amen in the house of God for that one? Uh, Where they just feel like everybody owes them something. I read in the Word of God where it says, if a man does not work, neither shall he eat. And hey, obviously, if you have a disability, if there's a challenge, God just saying, put the effort. It doesn't mean that you have to go do a nine to five, but are you putting effort in? 
Or do you just feel like everybody owes you something? That's a sign that your hunger is not from God, it's from the other guy. And you need to put that in check. And when I think about this customer mentality, I got to be honest. Again, in the right context, I totally get it. Me and my wife kind of have this little battle, especially in the summertime when the temperature starts rising. And we have this battle called the thermostat battle. Anybody else have this battle? Right? She wants to set it at about 75. I want to set it at about 72. And, you know, the craziest thing is, it's kind of comical to be honest with you, is we have the app now on our phones like some of you guys probably do. So we could literally be sitting on the opposite side of the couch and I can see her get her phone out and I'm like, she on that app? She's probably turning the temperature up. And so we get this. And, and why is that important in our context? Because we have to pay the bill at the end of the month, right? So you got to keep that in check because I have to contribute to the payment of that bill. But you know, about a month ago, we went to Cancun, Mexico. And we were in a hotel room. And you guys want to know what the temperature was that I set that thermostat on? 66, baby. <laughs> oh, man, it was lovely. I was in hog heaven. The only problem that I had is one night when I woke up, I mean, it was so cold. I'm not kidding you either. You know, and they're kind of tile floors. There was like condensation on the floor. <laughs> And so I was like, oh, whoa, this is awesome. Like waking up with dew on the ground, right? But, but that's the consumer mentality. Now you get that's properly applied. Hey, man, I paid the bill for this place. I want to crank it down to 66. I'm going to do that. But you see the mentality that we get into. And when it comes to the things of life, are we contributing? Or are we just consuming? We just always think the other guy's going to pick us up. Now, I'm going to get a couple of my pet peeves off of my chest, if you would let me. Here's a couple of my pet peeves that I think about really the example of the consumer or the entitled guy versus the guy who's willing to contribute and do his part. How about picking up your own trash? How about not littering people, okay? And what's the mentality? Somebody else got that. I mean, you could even be in a shopping mall and sometimes we'll throw stuff down and you think, oh, they got, they got guys that come around, they'll clean this. Why is it his job? Why don't you just contribute? Even when I go to the movie theater, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes, but I don't like to leave my popcorn box and my water and all those things that I had and just leave them there and go, hey, they have a kid that cleans the, the theater before the next. Why don't you clean it? The kid's probably got plenty to do. He's only making minimum wage, right? Contribute a little bit. That's one of my pet peeves. My other pet peeve, and this is one of my biggest ones, is put your stinking shopping carts back in the shopping cart return. <laughs> For God's sakes, could we contribute a little bit, people, right? I mean, how many of us, you know, Target, some of those places that are so busy, you pull in there and you see a hole up there close and you're like, oh, it's my day, right? God has answered my prayer. And you get up there close and you're about to pull in and there's three shopping carts in the stall. You're like, oh, Eve, come on, put your carts away. But to me, that's the exact mentality that we can take into life itself where, hey, somebody else is going to pick this up. Somebody else has got this. And even when it comes to church, church family, you know what? God has given you a gift. God has designed you specifically. He wants you to produce not only for his kingdom, but for your own satisfaction and fulfillment. But yet some of us will just fold our hands and say, oh, someone else will get that. They, I think they already got somebody doing that. They don't really need any help over there. Oh, I mean, I, I was over at the kids thing the other day. They got, it seems like they got plenty of teachers. What if we all just contributed? Can you imagine how amazing the church of God would be? Not just here at Impact Church, but the church of God worldwide. I got on this soapbox last time I preached, so I'm just going to hit it real quick. I can only imagine what the church, if it was united in doing what God had called it to do, would accomplish in the world around us. I mean, we want to point our fingers at government institutions and all of these different things. Gosh, if we just locked arms and all contributed, man, we would truly be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, a city that's set up on a hill. We would be who God has designed us to be, but we've got to get out of the consumer entitled attitude that says everybody owes me something. God has designed us to contribute. And again, it's a sign to me of where our hunger really is. Is your hunger to grab as much stuff around the world, to have everybody serve you, 
Or is it to say, God, you've designed me to contribute? I I read in the Bible that the ultimate example that Jesus wanted to set to his disciples is that he came to serve and not to be served. I mean, literally the last day that he's going to be with his disciples, he gets down on his hands and knees and he washes their feet. He's like, if you guys haven't got it yet, let me just show you one last example here. I mean, this is what it's all about is contributing. I pray that we would be a people who contribute. I think about a message I read about Mother Teresa and a statement that she made. Anybody ever hear of this gal? She's pretty awesome, wouldn't you say? I mean, you talk about someone that rocked her life and was really what God called her to be. She wrote these words. Mother Teresa said, I cannot do it all, but I promise I will give it my all. I mean, can you imagine if that was our mantra in life? Hey, I, I, I might not have all the gifts certain guys do. I, I'm, I might not have the ability certain people have. I can't do it all, but man, I'm going to give it my all. Whatever's in front of me, I'm going to give God my all. Last but not least, and I think we have to close with this, and that's the word compassionate. Compassionate. Because we can think about being contributors. We can think about activating things in our life. But it tells us in the Bible, without love, you're nothing but a loud noise. We've got to do it for the right reasons. We've got to do it with the right heart. We've got to do those things. We can't just sit around on our hands. But at the same time, it's got to come from the production of our heart and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Say, fill me. Fill me. Give me the strength to do what you've called me to do. Over and over, I see in the ministry of Jesus Christ where it says he had compassion on the people. There's one particular moment, many of us know about this story, known as Palm Sunday to many of us, the triumphal entry. And it says that Jesus, now riding, he sees this big crowd and it says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were wandering and going astray. And when you think about the word compassion, what you need to realize is there's a huge difference between compassion and pity. When you pity people, that means you look at them and you're like, man, that's a really bad situation they're in. My heart goes out to them. And there's nothing wrong with that in the right context. Here's the difference between pity and compassion. You recognize the need and you do whatever you can to help that need. It's the difference between driving by and saying, oh, wow, that's really sad, or saying, you know what? I got five extra minutes. I'm going to pull over and see if I can maybe lend a hand for that person who's pulled over on the street. Hey, uh, maybe I'm going to pull over. It might make me a couple minutes late. I think my my wife will understand, but I, I need to go and I need to go minister to this person's need. That's the difference of being who God has called us to. And that only happens when we have the hunger that God has designed us to truly have to be able to push down those cravings that come from the enemy and to be able to exalt those ones that come from God where God said this through the mouth of Jesus Christ on what is known as the Mount of Olives. He's there, the Sermon on the Mount, and he says these words. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then he adds a promise at the end, for they shall be. You want God to fill you today? You just need to simply cry out and say, God, give me the hunger that will be filled by you and by your spirit.